I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as Melissa said, I'm, I'm Kathleen DeRose. I'm the director of the Fubon Center for Technology, Business, and Innovation. And look, NYU and the Fubon Center are, are just so excited to be at the forefront of innovation and education, supporting our groundbreaking research, our recognized programs, educating future innovation leaders, including our recently launched Masters in FinTech, and, ex and hosting exciting events like this. So I'm, I'm just delighted to be here today to introduce our closing keynote speakers. First, let me introduce Jeffrey Schwartz. Jeffrey's passionate about building cutting edge digital products and ventures. He's currently the head of strategy at Frog, where he leads cross-disciplinary teams of strategists, designers, and engineers through the product development life cycle to design and launch new digital products and ventures. Jeffrey also, also teaches venture building at NYU Stern School of Business, and he was a resident advisor for Google's Design Incubator. Let me also introduce Jeffrey's colleague, Craig Cicero. Craig focuses on product strategy and business model design. He's particularly interested in combining ethnography with quantitative analysis to map evolving and underserved customer needs. Over the past seven years at Frog, he's helped shape his clients' innovation portfolios across a wide range of industries such as telecom, healthcare, financial services, and energy. I am so excited to hear this session. So we have 30 minutes of presentation followed by 10 minutes of questions. So take it away, gentlemen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Just a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll take a thumbs up from Kathleen if you can. Awesome. So um, Craig and I are super excited to be here um, both as practitioners, but also um, as part of the NYU community. Uh, for any students out there, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, quickly plug my and Craig's class. Uh, Craig teaches design strategies this spring at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. Um, I also will be teaching this spring at Stern, my class venture building for entrepreneurs. We'd love to see you there. Um, and also at the end of our presentation today, we'll leave you with um, both of our contact information if, if anyone wants to, to reach out. Cool, so uh, let's let's jump into the content. So we'll start with just a little bit on innovation. Um, so innovation, we believe, should help a company do one of two things, optimize or grow their business. Um, so when we break those two things down, let's start with optimize. Innovations that optimize could do one of two things as well. It could reduce costs or it could eliminate costs. And then on the flip side, when we think about innovations for growth, they could do one of two things. They could strengthen customer relationships, more wallet share, more mind share, more engagement, or they could develop relationships with new customers. So given kind of the vast array of things that we could talk about today, we're gonna focus our conversation on growth-oriented innovations that strengthen relationships with existing customers. Okay? Um, and we're gonna do that by starting with a framework that breaks down customer relationships. Then we'll use that framework to pinpoint where and how an organization should innovate to strengthen their customer relationships. And then finally, what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll zoom out and explain how an organization can prioritize the, the right mix of innovations to commercialize. Um, next slide, please. Um, and to, to help ground the, the theory that we're describing, um, what we're gonna be using is Airbnb as a reference example um, throughout the, the course of the presentation. All right, so, so let's jump right in. Um, we've got a lot of content also, so we're gonna be talking relatively quickly. Um, feel free to, to chat us if we're moving too fast, but hopefully we can get through everything in the, in the time allotted. So what is a customer relationship? Uh, next slide, please. An organization's customer relationship is the summary of all the interactions that they have with a customer over time. So let's think about this. The, this includes the, um, the company's websites and apps that a customer would use, the stores that they would shop at, the social media handles that they would subscribe to and interact with. It's the cumulative impact of all of these kind of connected interactions over time that we use to refer to as a customer relationship, okay? So for an organization, um, so if, if an organization wants to innovate, they need to understand, and they wanna understand where and how to innovate, they first need to have a clear understanding of a customer relationship. And so luckily we have this um, kind of simple framework 
that we use to break down customer relationships. Um, and we do that into the four components required to build one. So those are archetypes, activities, interactions, and principles. And what I'm gonna do in the following slides is I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe each of the components and then I'll use Airbnb as a, as a case study to bring kind of each of these components to life. All right, so let's, let's start with archetypes. So a, a great customer relationship relies on um, an organization's deep understanding of their customer. I mean, like, think about it. After all, like, if you want to build a relationship with somebody, how can you do that if you barely know them? So archetypes basically represent the person that you care about. This is the, the person or the customer that you want to get to know, all right? Um, so let's, let's take this and put it into practice with um, Airbnb, and we'll give you a hypothetical archetype that we created for Airbnb. And we call them the, the experience explorer, okay? So on the left side of the page, um, what you'll see is a, a brief description of their likes and tendencies. And in the center, um, we've captured their needs and their desires. Um, and so when, when we are building archetypes and capturing their needs, we tend to use um, a Mad Lib technique to, to keep the focus on the customer. And it's, it's quite simple and it has two parts to it. So the first part captures the need. So in this case, it would be the experience explorer needs blank. And then the second part of the Mad Lib captures the why. Why does an experience explorer need that thing? So as an example, the experience explorer needs a secure way to go off the beaten path. Why? So that they have the freedom to explore and discover new things. Cool. Um, so you can see all these. I'm not going to exhaust them, um, but instead we're going to move on to the activities part of the framework and we'll bring this back into the conversation in just a second. So we did archetypes, the customer. Now let's move on to activities. Activities are the things that are happening in your customer's life. So designing a customer relationship requires an organization to have perspective and to understand all the steps a customer goes through across their end-to-end -end journey, whatever that journey might be. And just like a relationship, a good friend understands what you've been through and where you're going. They understand your life holistically and so should an organization. And so on the next slide, what we've tried to do is give you a sense of what we mean by activities. And we've expressed those activities across a sample end-to-end -end journey for the Experience Explorer archetype, okay? So this is the travel journey. And on the top, you see the stages. And then underneath them are the activities. So from dreaming to sharing, and then all of the activities that the Experience Explorer would go through across that end-to-end -end journey. So for, let's just like pull out a few and talk about them. So in the dreaming stage, as an example, the Experience Explorer might be looking to get inspired, maybe reading magazines or blogs to get familiar with a potential destination for a weekend getaway. Um, or in the planning stage, they might be doing some research on where to stay or looking for neighborhoods that aren't too touristy. So we do this all the way across the end-to-end -end journey and you get the gist. Activities really give organization that organizations that kind of expansive picture of what their customers are doing. And also more importantly, they represent opportunities for organizations to get closer and to deepen their relationships with their customers. All right, so we've done archetypes, we've done activities, and the last two components that make up the customer relationship are what we describe as interactions and principles. So interactions are the actual exchanges an organization has with their customer. And then principles are what guide each interaction. So maintaining consistency, let alone creating meaning across interactions is a major challenge for companies today, requiring all parts of the organization, starting typically from the top to align on a set of principles to, to guide interactions. And so uh, maybe that sounds a little bit consultancy. So wh why is this important? Imagine if you had a friend who acted differently every time you saw them. You would say, oh, that person's fake or that person's inauthentic. 
So this is the same when it comes to um, organizations. Deep relationships won't form if a customer relationship is unreliable or inconsistent or wrought with shallow interactions. So on the next slide, to address this, we create experience principles. And these principles are basically just criteria that are directly connected to the customer needs. And these are what guide the interactions and enable organizations to make smart decisions that resonate with their customers. So to keep things clear and organized, again, I like to use a Mad Lib um, that connects the archetypes needs on the left side to the um, experience principle on the right. So the first part of the Mad Lib um, you'll see here on the left side, because the Experience Explorer references the need, seeks a way to go off the beaten path, then you got the principle on the right side. The experience must be adventurous, creating opportunities to try out and discover new things. So again, need, 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 principle, 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 adventurous, communal, hospitable, and local. So. Now we've got all of these principles that are directly tied to the archetypes needs. And let's go to the next slide. And we've got all of the components that are necessary to understand the customer relationship. So now we're in a good position to identify where and how to innovate. And we're gonna show you how here. So this next slide, I'm gonna warn you. Um, one more, please is a little bit of an eye chart. So there's a lot going on, but we've talked about each of these things. So let me just break it down for a quick second. On the top left, you've got your archetype, the experience explorer. And then on the top, on the top are the stages above the activities. Then you've got each of the activities underneath. And then underneath the activities, you'll see the interactions. This is where the organizations and the customer engage. And then beneath the interactions, remember you've got those principles. And these are what um, organizations use to ensure that those interactions are gonna be consistent and meaning, meaningfully connected to the experience explorer's needs, okay? So we've got this framework. And now what I'm gonna ask you to do is kind of suspend disbelief for a second and go back in time with me to 2008 when Airbnb wasn't Airbnb, but instead they were airbedandbreakfast.com. And at this time, Airbnb was primarily helping the experience explorer find lower price accommodation options in like major metro cities like DC and San Francisco. Um, and whether they knew it or not, the product that they had was very much aligned with the experience principles that we just showed you. Um, showing pictures of the local you'd be staying with um, as an example, and really what's, what's more adventurous than you know, sleeping on someone else's couch. Um, if you go to the next slide. So um, here you can see those experience principles are checked off, air, bed, and breakfast right there, really addressing that critical moment of comparing prices um, of accommodations across different destinations. So at this time, um, Airbnb, or maybe it was maybe a year or so later, um, Airbnb started to raise money. I think they ended up raising about you know seven to ten million dollars in capital, and they needed to find growth. And so, what did they do? They looked across the different stages of the Experience Explorer's journey to see where else they could innovate. So, this is getting back to that question: like, where do we innovate? Well, you look horizontally across your customers' activities. You ask yourself, well, what could we do to strengthen our relationship across that end to end journey? So they might have started in the dreaming phase and they might have looked at one of the critical activities the Experience Explorer goes through, which is familiarizing themselves with potential destinations. If you go to the next slide, please. So what tends to happen in these scenarios is you got your archetype, you've got their activity, and then you can ask yourself, how might we question using the experience principles? So let me show you how they did this. Layering on the local experience principle with the activity, they might have said, how might we inspire the experience explorer with popular destinations curated by locals? And this is likely how the innovation of Airbnb guides was born. Um, so if you go to the next slide, 
Airbnb Guides um, was a collection of locations and things to do in neighborhoods that was uh, carefully curated by those in the know um, with the intention of helping people who are visiting but want to live as locals. Um, just a quick caveat here, this screenshot and the others that you'll see in a second, these are pulled directly, these were pulled directly from um, Airbnb's website. So that was one innovation. So next they could have looked at the planning phase and done the same thing. Let's, let's grab an activity, let's grab one or two experience principles, run some how might we statements, how might we help the experience explore, verify the quality of the destination so that they know the accommodations are pleasant to stay in. And this is likely how the concept of super hosts was born. So if you go to the next slide, super hosts make it easy to find quality accommodations with trustworthy hosts who have a proven track record, if you go to the next slide, of making guest trips memorable. So if you are on Airbnb and you're searching for an accommodation, you can toggle right here where it says super hosts and you can get filtered results that's going to um, make those accommodations um, more refined. Um, and they're um, gonna leverage the, the trustworthiness of the host to kind of meet that need that we just uh, described. So let's do one more. Um, we'll target the, uh, the experiencing phase here of the journey. And similarly, Airbnb might have grabbed that need, discover and, and locate local activities and food spots. Um, and one or two of those experience principles and pose the question, how might we connect the experience explorer with locals hosting activities or events? And um, Airbnb uh, did just that with experiences. So. Airbnb experiences are um, in-person or online activities like photography workshops or cooking or surf classes that are hosted by local aficionados who wanna share their passion with others. So imagine this exercise ha happens over and over again, right? Onto the next slide, um, across the entire end to end journey, Airbnb, would be left with a robust portfolio of innovations to serve the needs of their archetype. But now the question is, well, we've got so many innovations, which one do we choose and why? And so I'm gonna pass the baton to Craig and he's gonna deep dive into the answer to this question here. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, quick check, any issues with the audio? Can you hear me all right? Excellent. Cool. So yeah, that's, it's a common situation. You're coming out of the strategy workshop and everybody's hyped up about all the ways you can strengthen the customer relationship and you got to decide which innovations are we going to invest in. And so when you take this relationship based view of growth, the real question that you want to ask in this scenario is what portfolio of innovations is going to strengthen the customer relationship the, the most. And so I'll share a few words now about how we think about that question and a framework you can use to answer that question for your products, your company, whatever it is. And, and it starts from this very relatable claim, you know, something we're probably all very familiar with is that strengthening relationships is a multi-layered endeavor. There is no simple single rule for how to grow relationships. And our, our way of looking at it is that you actually have to balance three key imperatives all the time. So first off, you can't be upsetting your partner. You got to get the basics right. Okay. So you see the quote below there. You can't be taking phone calls while your partner is in the middle of the most tense part of the Game of Thrones episode. You're just going to create exponential dissatisfaction there. Uh, the second imperative is that you need to perform well on your partner's articulated needs. Okay, so you can see the quote below there, taking you know, care of a, a tidy house is, is an articulated need. And, and, and so you can see here how, how you've performed well on that need. And then the last imperative is that you have to surprise and delight from time to time. And you, know, you want to hear your partner saying things like, how in the world did you know I would like something like that? And, and our point here, our claim about all this is that you can't do well on just one of these layers and expect the relationship to grow. If you focus on the basics and articulated needs, you risk becoming predictable. And if you're constantly just trying to surprise and delight, it might be cool at first, but it's really gonna become problematic in the long run. And so 
our, our claim here is that you need to build your innovation portfolio so that it plays well on all three levels concurrently. And this mental model that we'll talk through, you know, it's it's a way of thinking about the portfolio that helps you balance risk, uh, eliminating issues that can lead to exponential dissatisfaction while opening yourself up to some exponential gains in satisfaction. So let's let's take a bit of a closer look at how it works. Um, now, in a relationship with with your customer archetype, your life partner, whatever it is, you're constantly working on these three imperatives. And sometimes your execution is flawless and sometimes it's not so flawless. So, you know, as an example, your partner is a floral enthusiast and, you know, you decide to get them flowers one day. It's great, but you got the flowers that your partner is allergic to. That's an example of, of poor execution. And so that's, that's great. And, 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 and the thing is that sometimes when you perform well, it, it leads to higher satisfaction. And, and sometimes when you perform poorly, it leads to low satisfaction but it's not that simple. Um, your performance on the three imperatives actually creates very different outcomes in terms of satisfaction, uh, which is illustrated by the three slopes uh, that you see on the lines on the graph. And, and each of these lines represents the three uh, relationship imperatives that I was talking about. For those of you who are familiar with the Kano model, this is gonna look familiar. Um, and so let's take a bit of a closer look at how each, how addressing each imperative leads to different satisfaction outcomes, which, you know, leads to uh, strength of strength of the relationship. So the first curve, the first imperative of strengthening relationships is what we call the basics. And, and you can see this line has two distinct features. As you move towards poor execution on the left, the curve drops exponentially. And as you move towards flawless execution on the right, the gain in satisfaction has its limit. And this is because when it comes to the basics, the best you can do is meet expectations. So in this situation, even if you decide to, you know, get up off the couch and walk out of the room to take your phone call uh, and let your partner enjoy Game of Thrones, it's not going to lead to this huge jump in satisfaction, right? You're meeting expectations. That's what the basics is. And it's important, but it's different than the other parts of uh, the, the, the map here. And so, you know, going from good to great in this space does not create significant gains in relationship strength. So when it comes to the need of like getting to know the homestay and its amenities, filtering by amenities is like a pretty good, pretty good solution to that right now. If you go and invest in amenity detail pages with all of these extra bells and whistles, you can't expect it to create a huge gain in satisfaction or the strength of the relationship. And it goes the other way as well. I mean, if you remove if you remove the filter by amenity, that's a disaster. And so that's that's the basic idea behind uh, the, the basics curve. The second imperative it, it relates to what we were calling the articulated needs before. And and this line is very simple. It's it's quite linear. Um, you know, as you improve in execution, satisfaction goes up proportionally. And the, the the way to think about articulated needs is that they're the standard factors of competition. It's, it's what people are looking for in a relationship, you know, what they, what they say they are. And it's, it's what customers and archetypes openly and consciously use to select their service providers. And the logic here is, you know, the better you do on these needs, the better you do than the competition, the more satisfied your partner or your archetype is, what have you. And so let's take for an example, you know, that your partner, one of their articulated needs is, is keeping a tidy wardrobe. Okay, so really, you know, poor performance over there. You can see on the left-hand side, honey, you left wet laundry in the dryer and now it stinks again. Okay, so, you know, not the end of the world, not exponentially decreasing, but definitely a step towards dissatisfaction. Whereas you move towards flawless execution, you know, you get the line of not only did you do the laundry, but you folded it as well. Thank you so much. Fantastic execution. Now, when it comes to Airbnb, this is well illustrated by the super hosts feature. And so this feature is addressing a need that we would classify as an articulated need. You know, verifying the quality of the destination was a common factor by which customers were evaluating the platform at the time. Um, and so the better you did on that, the greater the satisfaction. And, you know, before the super hosts feature, the need wasn't like executed in a great way. Was it awful? No, uh, but users had to triangulate photos and reviews 
to understand the quality of the house. And, and the introduction of Superhost, it brought this instant trust to the table and, and led to a proportional gain in satisfaction and relationship and all that good stuff. And the third imperative, uh, what we mentioned before, was all about surprising and delighting from time to time. This one's super important. Um, now, this line has two features that are worth calling out. When execution is poor on the left-hand side, satisfaction doesn't really drop. It kind of just levels out and it's not a big deal. But when execution is really good, satisfaction jumps exponentially. And so, you know, if, if you take a risk and you, and you take a shot in an articulated need, but you fall short, you're not going to get that much slack. Your partner will say, interesting idea. It's the effort that counts. Don't worry about it. Uh, however, if you take the risk on an unarticulated need and you knock it out of the park, you're going to hear something like, how did you even know that I would like this? What a pleasant surprise, significant, you know, faster velocity in, in getting to higher satisfaction. And in a business context, in a, in a customer relationship context, uh, one of the innovations that represents this kind of jump is around experiences. And so, you know, the need of discovering and locating local activities and food spots it wasn't really a common factor of competition for Airbnb when they introduced that innovation. You know, it's not that the, the customers were choosing, air, you know, different platforms based specifically on this need at the time. Sure, you know, hosts would like give some inconsistent recommendations on where to go. And if they didn't work out, it wasn't that big of a deal. So by taking a risk on this and, and innovating a great product like experiences, it created an exponential increase in customer satisfaction and therefore has a big increase on the strength of the customer relationship. So all that to say, we understand how addressing each of the imperatives creates varying outcomes in terms of relationship strength. Okay, so to summarize, messing up the basics, you can weaken things significantly. Doing better than the competition on articulated needs, great way to build the relationship uh, incrementally. Serving an unarticulated need really well creates an outsized jump in satisfaction and can really catalyze the, the strength of the relationship. And so now that we understand how the different imperatives affect relationship strength, let's discuss how do we use this framework to actually build a portfolio on a practical level. All right. So on this map here, we got a, we got a, a map with eight different opportunities, eight different innovations that we have to choose from. We don't have the resources at our company to go and build all eight. So how do we use this to, to make a selection that, that's optimal for, for strengthening the relationship? Now, we have some recommendations before we get into that. The basic principle, the basic principle that you're going for here is that you want to eliminate the issues that cause that deep drop in, dissat in, in satisfaction or cause dissatisfaction. And you want to invest in the innovations that have the greatest chance to deliver uh, big gains in, in satisfaction. And so let's take a bit of a closer look on how we recommend doing that. Uh, the three recommendations that we, that we want to share with you today. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to take care of that basics curve. So on the basics curve, if you see anything in the bottom left quadrant, you have to prioritize that first as part of the portfolio. Anything in that zone is just dangerous, right? You're, you're, you're building on top of a shaky foundation and it's not gonna lead to a growth in the relationship over time. The second recommendation is that you have to mix articulated and unarticulated needs. Um, your remaining resources in a given portfolio should be dedicated to innovation that targets both of those things. A good rule of thumb is that for every two innovations you do for articulated needs, you should have at least one on unarticulated needs meaning you have one very risky investment for, for every one that's a more moderate risk. And then lastly, uh, you want to build, test, and refine. So when you're looking at this map here with these positions on the, on the line chart, this is usually your first hypothesis of where stuff sits. And so you have to, you have to usually quickly prototype some of these things and, and gather customer data to make it precise about where it actually sits on the map. And so you do that over time to make your toughest decisions and, and, and that's a big part of this process. All right, so let's say we use these recommendations, we come back to our map, we would eventually arrive at the prioritization of going after innovation number two, four, five, and six. The rest of them have been deprioritized for the portfolio. Uh, starting at the bottom on the basics, we prioritize the accessibility focus, 
because the, the, the team believes that the, the failure designed for accessibility is a deal breaker for our current archetype, and that's causing some serious dissatisfaction. Okay, so that's taking care of the basics, step one. Step two, prioritize two of the features that meet the articulated needs in a meaningful way. And this is super hosts and, and curated wish lists. And then lastly, we look at the three options on the table for unarticulated needs, and we pick the one that we think um, is gonna have the biggest impact, the most likely to succeed, and that's experiences. And so the, what this does, these recommendations and this approach to the portfolio, it allows you to focus on the initiatives that are going to improve the customer relationships that are likely to improve the relationships while also giving you space to take a big risk that has a significant re reward, give you better competitive position, better customer relationship, all that good stuff. Now, if you don't like the lines on the chart or if you find them hard to work with, um, you know, an alternative framing of this that's a bit more simple and, and sometimes more practical is that you can simply categorize your, your potential innovations within the three imperatives, and then you stack rank them to understand which are gonna have the most impact. Right. So, so in order to stack rank, this is where you might be pulling in things like the size of the prize, uh, the, the viability, um, you know, the, the potential uh, profitability of each innovation. I mean, you can pull in all kinds of data points to stack rank, won't go into too much detail there, but you get some kind of evaluation of each of them and you apply the same recommendations from before. Okay. So you got to take care of the, the important stuff on the basics. Uh, spend the majority of your budget on articulated needs and then picking at least one art unarticulated need to take a risk on. And so, you know, using a stack ranking, you could, you could do that, apply the same recommendations and, and get to your portfolio. A few pitfalls to look for in, in prioritization broadly, but also with this framework. Um, first of all, risk aversion. I think we heard some of the previous speakers talking about this as well. Uh, there is the temptation to kind of focus on the basics or the articulated needs because they're less risky, but you really have to always try and address some unarticulated need, take a bigger risk as a way of, 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 of uh, accelerating on, on the relationship growth. Otherwise, you're going to be constantly chasing the competition. You're never taking that risk that's going to give you the, uh, the big jump forward. Second pitfall is ineffective stack ranking. And so, you know, within each category, you do have to do some work in order to understand which one's going to have the biggest impact in that category. And so, you know, it's important to work on your stack ranking capabilities. And then lastly, innovating in a box. Um, as I mentioned before, you got to go out, build, test, refine. If you're just doing this exercise based upon hypotheses in a workshop, it gets a bit dangerous if you're working with like a really big investment. And so getting out in the field, prototyping, testing is essential. Great. So awesome. Yeah, Jeffrey, you want to close us out here? I was just going to say we um, we've got just a little bit of time left. We, we kind of covered off everything that we said we were going to cover off. So maybe we can open it up to, to questions and um, from from the group. No, that's great. Thanks, guys. I, I thought that was fascinating. I'm, I'm finding myself kind of excitedly, but also nervously cataloging whether in all my relationships and business settings, I'm actually delivering on unarticulated needs. So really interesting framework, really super helpful. Maybe just to kick one off, um, and I invite the audience to post their questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. So you identified Superhost as an innovation that made um, addressed a, a key need of, of Airbnb customers. And I'm wondering if you could just connect the dots to the other side of the Airbnb platform, because that catalyzed behavior change on you know, the, the host side as well, as well as the revenue model associated with it. I'm wondering if you could just riff on that as well. Awesome. Um, sure. Great question. So um, between everybody on this call, I should tell you that um, truth be told, Airbnb should have created two archetypes, one for, because they have two customers, not just one. So the hosts are customers, but, oh, I'm, excuse me, the, the customers, the guests are customers and the hosts are also customers, right? So you have to understand the unarticulated and articulated needs of your hosts as well, archetype them, understand their journey. And what's challenging in multi-stakeholder um, ecosystems like this, when you've got two different customers is that you got to have a win-win. You know, 
in business, it's tough sometimes um, to just have a win with one customer. So in Airbnb's case, you got to find overlapping value for your hosts and your guests. Um, so yes, uh, they would have had to gone through that exact same exercise with a different archetype for the other side of the market. Can I ask something related to that? That's, I, I loved your slides. I love the way you set it all up. And uh, I loved how you split across the different kinds of needs. But, and, I, and it, you know, I do something a little bit similar in my class and then I talk about the marginal payoff to improving on, a, on different dimensions. Like if you tease some at some technology apartment, different dimensions of, along which it's improving, hopefully. Some have big payoffs and some have little payoffs, which is kind of captured by your graphs. But, what, but uh, then the next thing we usually get into is the cost or difficulty of moving along one of those dimensions. And I didn't see you talk about that explicitly in your slides. And I'm wondering if it's implicit in the stack ranking that you're thinking about, well, it's it's actually really hard to improve from six to seven, but it's easier to improve from four to five or, or something like that. Yeah, I can speak to that one. I think, you know, in, in the stack ranking, you're you're doing your kind of traditional ROI sketch on each of the opportunities from both like, you know, a, a revenue impact and a cost side. And so whether you're talking about like the movement along the lines or the stack ranking, you, you want to involve that kind of traditional analysis to back it up. Okay, cool. And is it different for a company, this relates, I think, to Kathleen's question, is it different for a company like Airbnb that only has to come up with the idea and the mechanism to put it online versus the host, which is facing the difference between, well, if I put a fire extinguisher, I'm going to check one more of those super host boxes versus I'm going to switch to all white bedding and towels, which is going to be a, an ongoing bigger cost to check one of those super host boxes. Like from Airbnb's perspective, they don't have to bear the cost as much of these ideas in a way because they just have to put, well, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I envision it that Airbnb just has to put the functionality available on a website, but the host has to actually make them happen in, in real life, the big IRL. Yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is, so when, when you're modeling the business, um, you've got two distinct customers, right? You've got the host and you've got the guest, and then you've got key activities and key resources and key partners that you need to spend money on as Airbnb to support their unmet needs. And if you don't, somebody else will, and then you're toast, right? So it's the same thing. It's like, you know, it's a relationship. Airbnb has to have strong relationships with their hosts, which they do an incredible job at. They have like a host fund. I mean, it is, it, it's pretty impressive, but I mean, I don't think that, that Brian Chesky, you know, thought about this strategically the way that we are thinking about it, broke down the, the components like we've done. I think he's just such a sharp, an intuitive entrepreneur that he just kind of did it intuitively, organically. But yeah, if you don't understand your your customers' needs and you don't go out of the way to try and address them, somebody else will. And like the next thing you know, you've you've lost your partner for somebody else. So I think I think we're actually out of time. That went so incredibly quickly. Um, there is there is maybe one more question. We'll do that, and then um, we'll have to all go away and just just think about this. Um, so yeah, sorry, it's, sorry, we didn't we 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 really wanted to present this material. We've been working on it. We thought it would be a fun place to share it, and I know it's a lot. So sorry, no, we couldn't no, no, have more it, time for Q and A. It, it, it was great. This is this is a question coming from Sadiq, and the question is: um, Financial services have customers and believe they have a relationship with them but the interactions are just mostly purely transactional. And so just looking for some application of this framework to financial services. Mm. Oh, it's, it's such a fantastic question. So um, it, it takes you all the way back to the customer. So the archetype, right? So when we're building archetypes and we're looking at their unmet needs, we're trying to understand their unmet needs, what we, what we try our best to do is capture higher order needs like affiliation, self-fulfillment, community, like Airbnb's case, belonging is like their thing, right? Because th these are what do the heavy lifting and establishing kind of that emotional hook, the emotional connection that create long lasting relationships. Now, what's tricky is that 
especially for a lot of financial service companies, lower order needs like convenience, time savings, things that kind of are commoditized and sometimes feel transactional. They're important, but they might not give you the depth that you want in building a connection um, and establishing strong customer relationships. And so it's a tricky thing. And there's, there's companies like, you know, Cash App is actually a fantastic example of a financial services firm that's been able to move around the transactional notion of like what it means to be a bank and create connection through community and culture with their customers, which is what makes them so successful. So it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. But, um, you know, if you can find that emotional hook and grab depth in your relationship, it really, really works for customer loyalty. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a behavioral or emotional component to finance and not just the uh, not just the raw transaction. So it's a really good point you guys are making. So this is an awesome, awesome talk and a fantastic way to close out the conference. I'm, I'm going to hand it back to our, our host, Melissa, just for, for any closing remarks she wants to make. But I really enjoyed moderating this session. And, and thank you guys so much for capping this conference off. Let me just say thank you so much to Jeffrey and Craig and Kathleen. That was a great session. I was just wrapped the entire time. I really, really fabulous. And I learned so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also want to say thank you to all the speakers, to all the audience, to all the people who registered. As I mentioned, we had over 430 people who registered. Some of them are going to watch the recording in their own in their own time. Uh, a lot of them joined us here today, but thank you for coming. We're really, really glad that you did. We also want to say thank you to Fubon Corporation for making this possible. Uh, and especially, especially, especially need to say thank you to Elizabeth Chen, who does all the back end heavy lifting on this thing and makes it so smooth. And so easy, we would be lost without you, Elizabeth. So thank you to Elizabeth. Also, one last thing before you go, we have a fireside chat coming up on artificial intelligence. It's gonna be super cool. It's about what AI is and what AI is not, what it can do, what it can't do. And that's gonna be a fireside chat between Gary Marcus and our own Foster Provost, two really high powered uh, people who've done a lot of thinking about this. It's gonna be October 19th, 6 p.m. virtual. So sign up for that on our webpage. And with that, we're done. So thank you for coming and we'll see you next time.